Hey everybody, you're listening to the Comic Book Bears Podcast. I'm Billy Z. I'm Brian Pittard. I'm Steve Mori. And this episode, which is our 99th episode, is going to be a little bit different. The date that we're recording this, it is June 14th. And as the world knows, on June 12th, uh, there was a mass shooting that occurred inside Pulse, which is a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. The shooting resulted in 49 deaths, including the gunman who was killed by police after a three-hour standoff. And uh, that also resulted with another 53 injured. At the time we're recording this, six of those injured or remain in critical condition. Uh, the attack turns out to be the deadliest mass shooting by a single gunman in U.S. history. It's the deadliest incident of violence against LG, <coughs> LGBT people in U.S. history and the deadliest terror attack in the United States since the September 11th attacks. Naturally, with our brother Brian being down in Orlando, that hit very close to home. I'm pretty sure that most people who listen to this podcast also listen to Brian's own Flame On. And on Sunday night, Brian and uh, Pat Norrell uh, recorded a, an immensely moving show in relation to the, the tragedy. And uh, if you haven't listened to that, stop this recording right now and go over to that one first. And then uh, maybe jump back to us. But, uh, Brian, the main thing I'm asking you right off the bat is how you doing. Um, um. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm fine. But here's the thing: I've been so busy since uh, last week. I mean, I was gone last week. I was out of town. I came back very early on Saturday. I had a full day of stuff Saturday. I didn't go out Saturday night. And I pretty much crashed. And then my mom woke me up first thing Sunday morning at like six a.m. to see if I was okay. And I've pretty much been on the go since. Like I have not, I've not allowed myself much of a moment to sit and think and ponder. I mean. We did the recording Sunday evening, of course, but even then it's like, you know, you, you're kind of, and Bill, you know, like you're, you're in that moment of sort of running things and, you know, the episode that we did, you know, everyone had very raw reactions and Oral was, you know, very, you know, moved and upset and Pat was very moved and upset and even Jared at one point after the recording, of course, not during, like broke down and like it's. It's just been go. It's been on the go. So I think I told Pat this today. I haven't had a chance to really, really sit and think. I mean, even at the vigil last night, standing there in the um, downtown Orlando in this uh, Dr. Phillips uh, Performing Arts Center lawn, I was conducting the band that was performing before the, the rally or the vigil. And then standing in the vigil, I'm just listening, but kind of also just like taking in the sights and seeing and kind of not reporting, but I mean, I certainly took pictures and posted stuff on social media. So, yeah, I just don't, I just don't think I've really dealt with it yet. Mm -hmm. But that I mean, hasn't been fully absorbed. Yeah, and yeah. then the only moments that that have hit me, honestly, are these like fleeting passing. Like I got home last night from uh, after the rally, I went to the bar to see Pat at his his job and sort of see what the community was like there and. It, uh, it was very, actually very comforting because it felt very normal. It felt very back to what I considered normal. In fact, if anything, it felt very, uh, like community building. Like there were people just hanging out, talking, sharing stories, doing what we do at gay bars, you know, um, the best, of, the best of the things we do at gay bars. And then I got home and I had one of these quiet moments on social media where I was just looking at things and watching little videos and I watched the Stephen Colbert like monologue that he did about the shooting and that about broke me down, you know, for a little bit. And, and then just, you know, little things here and there have had that effect. You know, music has had that effect somewhat, but again, it's, it's fleeting. So, I mean, this is, was, this is a wound that's not going to heal quickly. It's going to take, you know, months and months and months, but it's, it's also something that I, I want to channel like it's kind of like when I broke up with my first boyfriend or one of my close uh, animals, you know, passed. I those were moments I felt like I needed to channel that that emotion that I don't normally tap into as deeply into something. And that podcast last uh, Saturday or Sunday was really, I think, good for that. This tonight, you know, will help with that. I just want to I want to create meaning out of meaninglessness. So uh, I think that's I think that's where I'm at right now. Mm hmm. 
Now, I had heard about this waking up on Saturday morning, and then I have, this is like the most ridiculous setup. I rest one of my iPhones on the CPAP, and it's stupid, but it's like a comfort thing. I don't know. And I had seen the ping from Justin asking Brian on our, we, we have a thread that goes on, an IM thread among the five of us, and asking, first thing was if you were okay. And that was how I, that was how I first heard about it. Steve, how about you? Uh, that was it as well. I had no idea when I saw that because I, I got up early on Sunday morning and I, I really didn't, you know, since since uh, my husband's actually been out of town, he's been in Colorado uh, attending the funeral of his grandfather. Um, I kind of was in a over the weekend kind of in a, a communication bubble. I didn't really pay much attention to what was going on outside uh, until uh, until Justin sent his text, and at which point I was like, "Well, what are you talking about? What's what do you mean? What's going on?" And that's when I saw all of the news uh, posted through BBC, through Google Now, through Facebook, um, everything actually. Now, Brian, I guess you can confirm this. It seems that this club was almost like a gay starter club. It seems well, there were a lot of younger people that attend this venue, and at least that's the way it's been portrayed. It's very much a younger club, generational. I mean, I've been going there for years. I mean, that the club, and it's weird how this plays out. I don't know if this is just the clientele they Kate like they they really try to attract. I mean, everyone has college night, everyone has Latino night. These are not unique things that they do, but. For whatever reason, since I started going there, you know, back in the 2000s and, and, and now when we've been back, I mean, we went to see Ben de la Creme there and another drag queen, uh, forgot now who the other person was. But, I mean, it was remarkable how young the crowd was and how energized and and diverse, but also just – it was just, it's a nice sense of community that was there, so – yeah, I think it very much is sort of a – I hate saying starter clubs. I feel like that diminishes, but, I mean, I've probably said it. And it's 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 a it's a unique vibe in Orlando, honestly. There's really no other club that quite has that same energy. You know, we're getting a lot of information regarding the shooter, Omar Martin. Uh, he's an American born to parents of Afghan background. He – pledged support to the leader of ISIL via a 911 call just before just before his attack yet there are numerous reports from various agencies it's not a single one um, from various sources that he went to the club at least a dozen times and may himself have been dealing with his own sexuality and this may have been a, a manifestation of that um of that conflict and uh you know geez how do you address that you know honestly the way i have tried although i broke my my own thing uh earlier this morning i think or maybe it was yesterday i don't know the days have kind of blended together i don't want to give the shooter any more air and and time and, and mental mm-hmm. energy than is and and i'm not saying this bill to you know i'm not criticizing yeah yeah saying, no but, absolutely i understand but it's one of these things where it is clear although actually let me back up i will make a corollary to that i'm okay with absolutely spreading the truth about the fact that this was a mentally troubled gay and confused man not a terrorist not a Islamic anything. I mean, yes. Did he identify with uh, radical Islam? Did he identify with ISIS or ISIL or da- da- Daesh or whatever you call it? Yeah, he identified with them. I could go around right, right now and identify with any number of organizations that I have no legitimate right or you know belonging to, and it doesn't change anything. So the fact that this guy did this was a, a last gasp at his bizarre, confused identity crisis that led him to do this. And if I'm fine with people in the media and everywhere spreading the the word that this man had this challenge and this problem, and I'm not trying to do it as like a way to, to just, you know, drag his name to the mud or, or, you know, demonize him or anything. I want just the truth. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, what infuriates me so much is when people take this as another, 
another brick in the war of terror and, and all this other stuff when that's not what this was. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is totally homegrown. This guy evidently has come out that he he had relationships with men. Some of his high school people said that they he had already identified as being gay. You know, he he struggled with this sexuality. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he had two wives, but he sounded like he was a real piece of work to them. Mm-hmm. So like, let's get the truth out that this was mm-hmm. not something organized this was not something that you can give credit to and above all else it was not an act of religion it was an act of confusion and hatred Mm -hmm. and and the more clear that is articulated to people they may still disagree and go well it's all the war on terror and da 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 but Mm -hmm. i think that's huge i think that's a huge distinction and it's an attack on our community it's not i saw somebody post today and i immediately unfriended them because i just could not handle it Mm -hmm. they were like well it's an attack on all americans and i don't know know why we're you know, bringing up the gay community, LGBT community. It's like, bitch, it was not just an attack on all of America. It was an attack on the gay lesbian community. I mean, you don't go to a gay bar and shoot it up if you want to just attack all Americans. You go to Disney, and he scouted Disney. Mm -hmm. That's been shown today. So it's like, don't diminish this as a hate crime because you want to fit it into your agenda of your war of religions that isn't Mm -hmm. real. You know, like, ah. Sorry, I didn't mean to rant. Well, but I just, no, I no but I think so. it's the time to rant. And there's some areas where I'm not sure if I'm in complete agreement with you. Tying into the issue of terror, this is somebody who was twice checked out by the FBI. And because of our insane gun control laws or lack of gun control laws, was able to legally purchase the weapon that did the majority of the damage. So there is that element of terror. You have to, uh, you have to acknowledge that. On top of it, when we're talking about someone's confusion, I mean, I see that so entwined in religion. And, you know, I've always, for a long time, I've always felt like the most hated entity in the world. And some, you know, if you defriend me over this, fine. But God should be the most hated entity anywhere because more more violent crimes are committed in his or her name than any than anything else. And... It's just times like this where I just, I just, I just can't reconcile, you know, these the validity of you know these wars over over whose imaginary friend is better. Well, and Bill, I'm not yeah. diminishing your yeah. not belief, but let me just tell yeah. you that I can claim that Obama, because of my sincere and dedicated devotion to our president you know, made me go out and do any number of misdeeds. And that doesn't make it true either. Mm -hmm. And as a person of faith, I have to tell you, God does not take credit for humanity's misuse of his identity, his legacy, his name. And I'm not saying his legacy is clean. I've read the old Testament. Let me tell you. But I will say that it is dangerous and it is, I feel really dismissive and, and um, not dismissive, uh, oversimplifying to cast all people of faith with a broad brush. And I know you're not doing that. Yeah. I totally know you're not doing that. But but is religion at play here? In a sense, yes. The mm-hmm. misuse of religious I, I extremism. And mm-hmm. any type of extremism, I feel, is problematic. And you can't get rid of it. It's a virus. It's a cancer. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that we can do, both people of faith and people who have you know, they're agnostic or they're they're atheist is just join together and share the best in each other's ideologies and crowd out the worst. Mm-hmm. That's the only only thing that in the end of the day, you know, bombs and gun control, as much as I'm not opposed to gun control and as much as I work for the military, so I'm not a hundred percent opposed to bombs. Right. You know, those are tools that are temporary. Those are things that we can do and have like maybe a sense of accomplishment about. But mm-hmm. the long-term war will come down to philosophy and ideals and and love and actually spreading love and light and not hate and darkness. So, you know, I, I take your point completely. Trust me. I I, mm-hmm. I don't I am not defending my fellow Christians who 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 spread hatred. But I call them on their shit. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's what you do. It's, it's the only thing you can do. So, but I, I t- totally take your point because you're right. Without religion, some of these ideas 
would not fester like they do. Mm-hmm. Steve, anything you want to add? Well, I mean, I've been thinking about this obviously nonstop since Sunday, and you know, you know, generally quiet about it because I I'm not the type who would post a lot of political, a lot of very, you know, angry or uh, emotional. Uh, posts on Facebook or social media just because that's really, you know, for me, it's very difficult uh, yeah. to articulate a lot of how I feel publicly because right. it's just. I also find that very interesting yeah. because out of all of us, you're probably the most politically involved. <laughs> it's Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about that. But it's just it, to, to me, it's, uh, you know, it is, it is so difficult because I, I come from a very, very conservative family. Um, and, you know, coming out for me was difficult because I knew that, uh, politically, uh, and religiously there is, you know, it would, was not something that would go over well. So it took me a little bit longer to come out. I was 21 for, for me, it was, you know, compared to, compared to, you know, people around my generation that was, uh, around my age that was a little bit later than others. But, um, you know, it's taken quite a bit of time, and I think even on uh, certain gay issues, uh, you know, I know gay marriage and uh, marriage equality and, uh, you know, protections, it's still something that I disagree with very strongly with my family. Um, because, that you know, using the, the standard conservative or Republican tropes of, well, you know, people shouldn't need special treatment, uh, blah, blah, blah. But a situation like this where – and again, you know, the amount of uh, – and I'm going to use the term because it's it, it's it's perfectly describing some of the reactions that I've heard from media, from pundits, the, the people who are loud and obnoxious and are constantly being heard anyway just because they're the only voices that seem to be played over and over again. But the idea of straight splaining where uh, these – the identity of the victims is downplayed. The, you know, the significance of it being a gay bar, a gay bar, and a, you know, a prominently gay. And again, not every victim was mm. LGBT. Uh, some of them were allies. Some of them were friends. Some of them were family members who were victims, who were shot uh, and killed, or shot and injured, who were there at the club as well. Um, but overwhelmingly, it was LGBT victims. And the idea that the bar or that the club was not singled out was not something that uh, the shooter knew exactly what he was doing when he was targeting the club, whether he had been there and been going there for years, whether he had been meeting people there uh, on Grindr or Jacked or whatever, um, you know, that's been coming out. He knew specifically what he was doing in going to a gay club and targeting gay, you know, gays and lesbians. And these were the victims. But every time that I turn on certain, uh, you know, news feeds, any time that I'm reading certain, uh, certain explanations or diatribes from, uh, I'd say very particular, um, very particular media outlets. Uh, that is completely washed away, as completely downplayed. The idea that it was a gay club on Latin night, and that's there's another thing too that most of the victims uh, were Latina or Latina as well. All of that is just being pushed to the side, and it's it's an attack on Americans. But I can tell you right now that I have not heard or read any one of those politicians that come out, any one of those pundits coming out saying uh, those gay, lesbian, bisexual victims, those are us. We are Americans. They are American. We are all together in this. It's always been, well, it's an attack on us. It's an attack on us. No, it's, it, it was an attack on a gay club. It was an attack on gays and lesbians specifically. And yes, we're all Americans, but mm -hmm. this was very, very specific. 
like Brian said, there are plenty of other venues that would have sent more of a terrorist message Mm -hmm. because, you know, plenty of, uh, and again, I hate to bring up religion because it's not necessarily always about religion, but that's usually the excuse that people use. Um, There are plenty of evangelical Christians and, and extremist Christian groups and spokespeople, whoever crazy or fringe that they may be, who celebrate this attack and basically have been talking about the same thing for months, if not years, decades, have been instrumental in informing policy at the highest levels and even at local levels. Um, you know, right here in Charlotte, we have had those same people protesting every event, uh, whether it's gay or not. Uh, they show up at Pride every year. They show up at Heroes Con every year, and we'll probably see them there this weekend. Um, but they also come to our town hall meetings anytime we have anything, uh, any debate involving gender or uh, sexual discrimination. And they have been basically saying the same things every time essentially looking for our complete disappearance from public view, oppressing our rights, removing any rights that we have, and possibly rounding us up in penalties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the fact that this rhetoric is out there and did not necessarily have to come from a foreign group on the other side of the world, from a terrorist organization, from a particular religion, it's there and it exists, and the rhetoric's continuing to be there even after this type of tragedy. And I I really hope that the supporters and the people who have who are witnessing this and are hearing these news reports and are seeing the horrors of this and are hearing the reports now, which I'm extremely happy to hear because the, those have been lacking the past couple of days, the reports of the people who survived mm-hmm. and who witnessed this and are telling us about, you know, the a uh, boyfriend who took a bullet to the back pushing his partner out the door to save his life the person who you know saved one of the bartenders by stopping the bleeding by dragging him into a hiding area so that he could stop the bleeding mm. uh, and stay with him for people who were shot and were protected you know by other people in the bar i want to hear more of these stories because i think that it's much harder for pundits and for reporters to ignore who these people are when they're alive. You know, victims are as awful as it sometimes sounds, the victims blur together. People see the, see the dead and they see the names and, you know, if they don't know them, they just see them as well, their faces, you know, they're just dead Americans. Um, like the 20 children who were massacred just four years ago in Connecticut. They were just names, but the survivors are the ones who can actually talk, the ones who can actually tell the story. And I think it'll be a lot harder for people to ignore the fact that this was a very clear attack on the LGBT community, that this was very clear attack on our safety, our sanctuary, our security, and our right to live without having to fear this kind of thing. And of course, yes, Americans have been victims of terrorist attacks before and will continue to be victims mm-hmm. of terrorist attacks and will be you know, victims of domestically created sociopaths and serial killers. But this was a very specific attack, just like that attack last year in Charleston on a black church with mm-hmm. black victims. Very, very specific. And yeah. I really am thinking that our community will not let the media will not let politicians forget that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not something I want. I don't yeah. Want. It's not what I want, but it's ours. It's something that you know. we, we should have to have. And I, yeah. you know, yes, these were Americans and yes, there were some non gay allies that were also killed and injured that were victims in this, uh-huh. but this this was a direct attack. This was a direct attack on a specific group of people that I'm a member of, the community that I'm a member of, that you're a member of, that we're all a member of on this podcast. So, On the notion of survivors, and I know there's been more time for dust to settle. Brian, do you know anybody that is a survivor? Uh, we know a DJ. Uh, his name is Ray. Um, he was working that night and actually got out. 
before the shooting was actually, I mean, it, it had started and he, I think he was out on the patio, but basically got out before he would even potentially have been in, in, injured. Um, so, I mean, he's a survivor, not in the sense that, I mean, he wasn't injured, but he got away. I haven't looked through the list of the names of the injured, quite honest, because mm-hmm. even though there's six that are still in critical condition at the hospital, um, just watching the names of the people who were killed, uh, confirmed killed, watching for my friend Drew, mm-hmm. uh, that was about all I, I really could take. Um, mm-hmm. Just, you know, like... Obviously, I will at some point see the, that other list, or I will hear from uh, friends or friends of friends who they knew. Um, but you know, it, it, most of the people I'm close with, like I, I know they're safe. I know they're fine. That was the better part of what I did on Sunday: is reach out to my friends and family who I thought might have potentially been at that club. In fact, a fraternity brother uh, was included on a tag of a post for someone like. He's in that same group of friends as my friend Drew and his boy, boyfriend Juan. And uh, I reached out to him immediately and I actually didn't hear back from him for, for several hours. And I was getting very concerned. But anyway, long story short, um, the injured are, are finally starting to speak. And uh, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking every time you hear any, any story from them because it's – I was driving home tonight and I heard on NPR just the, the horrific – horrific details of what the shooter was doing when he was, I guess, starting to sort of clear out the restroom that he ended up holding up in. And just Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like that fascination with gory details, but then very conflicted and contrasted with the, just, I can't, I can't right now, but you know, like there's, there's multiple halves of me that just, you know, go in those different directions and yeah, it's yeah. Anyway, so I, I feel like there probably will be some additional people who I know, at least in passing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just very relieved that, you know, selfishly very relieved that I only lost one friend mm-hmm. and fellow podcaster and not anymore because the gay geek community in Orlando could have also there. There's many other people who frequent that club and just thank God weren't there. Mm-hmm. So. One thing I think has been interesting is this developing understanding among people who aren't part of the LGBT community of the importance of bars. I had friends who were straight that are only now gaining an understanding of the importance of a safe zone. It's hard to call it now that, but of having a place to go where you can be yourself a little more than some other places. I feel very cut off in general from that since I came out so late in life but it is interesting seeing people develop that understanding and I I was just wondering if anybody had feelings about that about about what bars or you know possibly LGBT centers uh, played in your life and in terms of uh, of being a place to go and a place a place of developing your sense of identity I it's weird for me because I came out in college and only started going to the bars really actually in after college. I mean, towards the end of college, at least. And the only gay community that I knew of was in my fraternity of all places. You know, like I did not experience bars as a sense of community really until my thirties. Um, and I think it was a, I walled myself off from that experience because being raised like Steve, very conservative, very religious, all I knew of from, of bars were how seedy and, you know, people are promiscuous, they're doing drugs. It's just, it's a place of just, it's not what I wanted in my life as an influence. And only after basically having a boyfriend who works in bars do I realize that that was so so myopic and so limiting because even though that is not untrue like that is certainly a part of the experience the the community building you know having a a pub a public house of sorts you know to go and have a drink at to talk to people to sing you know karaoke to 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 hang out and just just be they they are safe spaces they are 
places of community building. They are very important. And I, I, I'm sad I missed I kind of like you, Bill. I'm sad I missed that more in my twenties. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, again, it's, it's, I found it now and I, I found it to be very rewarding. And I'm, I'm a pulse was such a place for me. I mean, pulse was like, I, I, you know, we talked about earlier. It's was my starter bar. I went there on Tuesday nights for $2, martinis and sang karaoke and that was amazing because even though i hung out pretty much with just my own friends there were certainly other people i encountered at that bar i i witnessed a community a a gay and lesbian community and the only community i had had prior to that was like my church growing up and my fraternity in college and then this was something else this was something different and the more communities that I find myself in, you know, the curling community, the musician community and, you know, whatever community, I feel like it just builds parts of me and connects parts of me to the world in a way that you cannot get if you don't reach out and actually try to exist in those spaces. And I, so I, yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. And I've heard so many people who don't, they, they can't, they can't understand that. All they can relate it to is, you know, churches and, maybe somewhat of their workplace. That's a community. I mean, you know, there's similar metaphors that other people who don't go to bars can use, but I think they, like me, were dismissive of it because they just, they've not experienced it. I, you know, again, kind of, you know, like Brian, I, I did not have a fraternity um, that I belonged to. Unfortunately, uh, uh, at my school, frats were kind of, they, they weren't exactly something that you'd want to belong to. Um, they were all study groups, basically. It's very strange. Um, but, uh, you know, outside of Greek life, we had a lot of clubs and a lot of uh, diverse groups um, that were, uh, you know, in uh, in the college community. So, you know, I took part in gaming club. And uh, when I finally did come out, um, I did uh, start going to events uh, thrown by the uh, – LGBT group on campus and got to know some of those people and, um, you know, had, had a really good time. And I, I always kind of felt ashamed of myself because I hadn't allowed myself to become part of that group sooner. Um, and, uh, you know, outside of the friend groups that I did have in college, I think that, you know, it would have definitely helped me probably come out sooner. It would have helped me be a little bit more comfortable with myself and, and understand or at least know how to, um, you know, come out to other people in my life, like my family and, you know, friends from high school and, and things like that. But um, afterwards, I think I, you know, I, I was a bit unfortunate and also a bit lazy on my own that uh, I tended to work a lot more rather than take part in, um, you know, events at gay bars because we had a, a very good one in Connecticut, Um called the Polo Club that unfortunately just closed uh, this past year. Um, That was the place to go in the Hartford area um, for drag shows, for, uh, you know, great performances, for really cool event nights. And and they were, again, it was, it had a mixed crowd. So you had a lot of really young people that uh, I was able to go with. And then you also had the old timers. You had the people who've been around uh, from Stonewall and had moved, you know, back to Connecticut or, you know, moved up from the New York Bridgeport area. Um, so, you know, you had the history, but you also had the the newer generation as well. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't spend an, enough time there, I think, to to really um, connect uh, with that. And it, that's to my detriment. And same thing here in Charlotte. Like, I don't really have any uh, bar or club that I connect with. Mm-hmm. And I think that is... Um, it, that's, that's to my loss, uh, for not really being part of the greater community. Like I have, I have a large number of gay friends and I spend a lot of time, uh, in my life and my, you know, uh, with, um, you know, with my own community, with my own family of, of friends. Um, but that's, it's not something that I was able to, to get at a bar. And I think I, I had that disconnect, unfortunately. And I think that I would have really experienced a lot more if I had that type of other community. Like, like Brian said, there's, you know, you just keep building, uh, you know, the different experiences, you keep building your different groups um, to really enrich your life. And that would have been something that I probably should have uh, done in my life. I didn't. So, yeah. 
Yeah, for for me, with uh, not really being in touch with uh, some of my feelings, and you know, you know, to this day, if you if I have to identify, I do identify as bisexual because uh, you know some of it is I don't want to negate some of the relationships I had before I started exploring the same sex side of me in earnest. Um, but I think I'm with Steve a lot in that I don't take advantage and I don't know if that's the proper term, take advantage, but, and and some of it is age too. You know, I'm going to be 50 in 13 months. Ooh, the first time I said that and Rob's smiling at me like, oh, you shouldn't have. No. Oh, please. (laughs) You're horrible. Cameo. Uh, but you, you know, if I, it's such a stupid thing to write, but let me just put it this way. If I got married tomorrow, my groomsmen would be 80% straight. The majority of my very close friends are straight. That's never mattered to me before. You know, I've, I've never felt that that was a, an issue. I, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that there is a support system out there, and I just – I've never turned to a support system simply because they are gay. But at the same token, I, I am comforted in that there are people I can turn to who <coughs> who might know a little bit more about what I might be going through than some other f- friends despite the best of their intentions. It's funny because I've never really thought too much about being out in the last 10 years. It was like I got to – a point where I was able to say it publicly. And then I luckily was in a number of work situations where there, at least to my knowledge, there never was an issue. There never was a problem in relation to being cut off from something. The major corporations and the major law firm I work for all had diversity in LGBT BRG groups, business resource groups. This whole event has really had me thinking about about being out and for some people, just a, the, the incredible amount of bravery that takes, no matter how far we have come as a society globally, it still is difficult. And as we've seen over the weekend, it does make you a target in certain situations. When you have these events, as I provided in the intro to the show, there's so much of a jumble here. And I think untangling that jumble and how you feel about certain issues that are tied in with an event like this, it's, you know, I mean, how can you not look inward? It's such a, I mean, yeah, I, I, I Bill, I feel like you're saying exactly what's in a lot of our hearts. It's, yeah. It's such a mess of things. There's no simple, there's no simple cause. There's no simple effect. Mm -hmm. It's, it's life. I mean, this, this is, this is the journey that we're all on. And, and, you know, we are affected now because it hits our community. But in, in many ways, people before us all over the world have had this affect them in their own communities, whether it be a black church in South Carolina, a, uh, you know, company community that is, is assaulted during their Christmas party. It, it really causes you to think about your community and your place in your community. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll say right now, I, I have been sort of coming around on certain things about my community that I've struggled with as, as far as the, the gay lesbian community. I, I had stopped going to my gay and lesbian band because I just wasn't connecting with them as a, as a band. And one of the most rewarding things I have had happen this past weekend is reconnecting with them in a very powerful way and really embracing that part of me. And, you know, as a musician and as a gay man, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to share a little bit of both at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and that's, that's a part of me I had sort of, you know, not completely pushed away, but these are the, these are these, these are these moments of change. These are these dialectics where we, we kind of have to make decisions and we have to confront our inner selves and really 
choose what we're going to do, mm-hmm. you know, and, and part of it's the, the reminder of mortality and part of it's the, 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 the inward thinking that forced that is forced upon us by all this. But, you know, if, 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 you know, someone said at their vigil last night, you know, no good, no good can come of this, but we will make good of this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is a hugely important distinction and a, and a, an important thing that I believe will happen. I mean, this, this kind of event absolutely is going to galvanize the LGBT community, which was starting to stratify among the generational lines. And I believe young people seeing this event, older people seeing this as a, another tragic event to affect their to our, our community like all of it kind of is gonna blend us a lot more than we were mm-hmm. you know i i really i really have to believe that this will this will cause change for for the best mm-hmm. but we still have like you know we still have to do it it's not just gonna happen it because we want it to and I, I, as much as I didn't like people who were saying, oh, thoughts and prayers don't mean anything, I'm pissed off, you know, like, I kind of agree. If it's, if it ends in our heads, if it ends in our inner reflection, it doesn't translate to outward action and outward changes in, in, in society and changes in our activism, then it's not going, we will not make good of this. Mm-hmm. But I, but I believe, I absolutely believe from witnessing Sunday in Orlando when, Thousands of people from every community came out to donate blood for the victims when, you know, in downtown Orlando, thousands and thousands of people gathered downtown. And just tonight in my alma mater, UCF, you know, hundreds and hundreds and, you know, people crowded in our student union to recognize this. And this is just day two or three. You know, this is early in the in the in the process that we're going to go through. And the outpouring of support is just it's it's just immense and it consoles me in this this dark time so yeah well i am looking at the clock and it's later than we'd anticipated some of that was because of skype problems on this boy's end but we did want to offer our thoughts and at least for myself it's the first time i've talked about some of these issues with people so uh, gentlemen, thank you for for being that um, that sounding board from from myself personally. It's important that typing keys on a keyboard, but from actually putting voice to some of the feelings and emotions that uh, have been brewing. So thank you. I'm just gonna go around the horn. I don't think it's a week for woofs, but uh, I'll start with Steve. If Steve, if there's anything else you'd like to add before we sign off. I don't know. I think I've I think I've said probably as much as I wanted to say. I've had conversations with people, um, you know, at at work and and personally this this week so far. Again, you know, it's only been a couple of days, but um, you know, it's still pretty difficult for me to talk about. And you know, it it feels strange because again, I you know, I'm not connected to the victims you know, in a very direct sense, but in a greater community sense, I think it, it is really something that's impacted a lot more people than, than it seems apparent. I mean, here in Charlotte, uh, just last night, uh, there was a candlelight vigil, um, where over a thousand people, um, came and, and it was actually held at, uh, one of the, uh, gay bars in towns bar, uh, in town bar 316, um, and, uh, you know, just an amazing turnout. The, uh, the mayor, um, also took the opportunity, uh, while she was there. And again, you know, the people decrying the politicization of this, well, unfortunately, it's a very political situation, um, took the opportunity to, uh, denounce HB2, um, which, you know, is, is again another strong message for something that I think in light of this, I'm hoping uh, it's going to be even harder now to justify uh, with our state governments. And I think a lot of the anti-LGBT legislation that's currently in the works in a lot of states, or at least is about to come on the books or has already been voted through, 
uh, might have a much tougher time justifying its existence in mm-hmm. the wake of this. So I'm I'm hoping that there will be some good coming out of that, and if not, at least a more militant and active, well, not militant, I, I, that's not the right word, a much more active and aggressive community response to, uh, and not just our community, but our allies as well, to this kind of ridiculous hate legislation, which saw the ultimate and um, and and pretty uh, obvious I don't want to say it's a conclusion but I, I you know the result of of all this anti-gay rhetoric um, was very clear to be seen on Sunday so I you know I think that I think that we've got an opportunity right now to reverse a lot of you know the discriminatory, bills that have been shoved through uh, state legislatures um, in the past two years as a response to marriage equality. And I think this is the this is the blowback that is going to be coming. OK. And then lastly, Brian, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I just want to thank uh, Rick Worley. Uh, he's a cartoonist at Northwest Press. He did a uh, sketch uh, drawing of Juan and Drew. Um, because he was inspired by their stories of love and their uh, their joint funeral that's going to be held uh, in the near future, uh, since they never had a joint wedding. So I, yeah. I'm really, really, I was really touched that he did it, and uh, really, really happy to see things commemorate my friend that I think he would have really appreciated in life. And we'll now appreciate in the afterlife. So I, uh, yeah, thanks, Rick. It was really nice to see that. And I definitely, uh, I'm also, you know, I'm touched every, every outcry of, of support from, from vigils across the country and the world to the simplest little Facebook message or text or email or phone call I've gotten in the last three days to check on us and send support is, is immensely meaningful. And I, I want to thank every, person without thanking every person for that because even though it's kind of you know constant and sometimes overwhelming to get back to everyone it's it's been very meaningful to to feel that support and that concern you know so thank thank you everyone and and present company completely included because you guys were definitely one of the first to reach out and verify everything was fine and i I guess i really appreciate it Okay, well, we'll be back maybe next week, maybe the week after. The next episode will be our 100th regular episode. I promise that it will be a bit more upbeat (laughs) than this one. I think that goes without saying. But if you did uh, stay the course and listen to this episode, thank you very much. There were a lot of things I think we needed to say and say to each other, and uh, that's about it. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears Podcast. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears Podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the Instagram as Comic Book Bears. You can find us on iTunes and Podbean and Stitcher Radio and some other platforms. If you want to write to us, you can do so by writing something to comicbookbears at gmail.com. So until next time, I'm Billy Z. I'm Brian Pittard. I'm Steve Morey. We'll be back soon. Take care, everyone. <laughs>